G'day, I'm Paul. So, when Toyota said they were making an electric vehicle, I was a bit excited by it because Toyota, big mainstream brand, them doing an electric vehicle feels slightly different to a startup doing it or some of the other brands that have been going through that electric vehicle, uh, I guess, revolution. So uh, then it took ages to get to Australia for some reason. So we do finally have it here in Australia and I am finally very keen to have a drive of it. So this competes with things like the Tesla Model Y, the Hyundai Ioniq 5, uh, the Ford Mustang markets, that sort of vehicle. This is the entry level, uh, the base model of the Toyota BZ4X. It's a bit of a strange name. The base comes in front wheel drive and if you do compare that to the rest of its competitors uh, they are all rear wheel drive vehicles the ones that I mentioned before in their entry level so it'll be interesting to see how that all sort of comes out in the wash $66,000 at the entry level there is also an all wheel drive version available that is slightly more expensive so today we're going to do a detailed review of the BZ4X so if you do want to skip ahead to other parts of this review you can use the time codes that are on the screen or if you're on YouTube, you can scroll down and use the chapters below. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon so you can find out every single time we do review of a new Toyota electric vehicle. Let's talk exterior design. And I'll start off with your optional colors. They're either 1500 or 2400. I don't know why they're so expensive. Uh, optional colors on a 300 series Land Cruiser are like seven, eight hundred dollars or something like that. So this is double the price or more, depending on which color you go for, which is really quite strange. Uh, in terms of the actual design itself, it has been pretty polarizing and and possibly here in the black as well, it, it kind of looks the best if you're after a non-polarizing look because you don't really see all of the black plastic parts around the vehicle. If you do like the look of that though, all of the other colors kind of offset it and really make them stand out. Whereas here in the black, it all blends in and look to me styling is entirely subjective but I actually quite like the look of this car it kind of just has a, has a really cool vibe to it you don't want an electric vehicle that looks like a science project but I like the path they've gone down here with this making it look a bit futuristic but not over the top kind of feels like what uh, Hyundai did with the Ionic 5 where it still looks futuristic but it's not over the top or too science project so um, yeah I mentioned all the plastic parts here um, obviously they're, they're lightweight panels uh, here there's a bit of aero off to the side there as well get full LED headlights. Uh, all of this section here is closed off. All the battery cooling occurs down the bottom here. Toyota logo. So unlike other Toyota vehicles we've tested before that have been hybrids where the logo has been uh, there but with a blue tinge, this is just a, a standard looking logo. Round to the side here, you've got 20 inch alloy wheels. So a big old set of wheels, decent profile rubber there as well. So I'm hoping that this rides well. I really don't want them to go down the path of, you know, just because electric vehicle to make it ride really firm and, and uncomfortably. I'm hoping this actually rides quite nicely. BEV there for battery electric vehicle with what looks like a little mood ring just next to it. Um, this is that plastic that I was talking about. A lot of it there on the sides and uh, on the back there as well. Indicator built into the wing mirror there. The entry level doesn't get a 360 camera. You do get privacy glass though. More of that plastic highlight that runs down the bottom there over to the back of the wheel arches and then come around to the rear with me. So over here, you'll see the, the design. It's not really sort of typical SUV proportions. It has that sort of swooping coupe look to it. You get a little bit of a spoiler there as well. Shark fin aerial up the top. Another spoiler there on the boot. And then this red strip that runs all the way along the back there. Full LED tail lights, uh, standard sort of looking Toyota logo there. And here's the, the BZ4X. It's confusing because you would assume four stands for all wheel drive, but this one's the, the front wheel drive. So um, I'm not really sure I understand the logic behind that naming and whether that will apply to all of their future electric vehicles. We'll see what happens. Um, a bit of uh, plastic cladding down the bottom there as well. So let me know what you reckon about the design. Styling is entirely subjective. I totally get that, but uh, I am curious to see what you reckon about the design. Let me know in the comments section below. So we are inside the BZ4X. Uh, let me run you through all the highlights. Start off with the key. So here it is here. Uh, you've got lock, unlock, boot and then a button there for the AC and a Toyota logo down the bottom, blank on the back. It's a proximity sensing key so you can leave that in your pocket. You've got a grab handle on the door and then a push button start just down here. Um, look the vibe with the interior here is that Toyota has tried to keep this as 
generic as possible. And when I say generic, I mean, if you're driving a Camry at the moment and you want to go buy an electric car, they want you to feel just like you're driving another Camry. So that means buttons for pretty much everything, a pretty straightforward gear selection, stop start button. And while a lot of people that are into tech and, and future EVs and all that sort of stuff might find this a bit um, sort of dated, this is actually what a lot of owners are going to want. Some people don't want the Tesla experience where there's just no buttons and now there's no stalks. I mean, uh, it is a lot to get used to. So um, yeah, look, I think this has its merits uh, to some degree, um, but uh, there are some bits where it falls apart. And I'll run you through those in a second. Um, I don't love the piano black. There is heaps of it. So throughout this whole center section, all along the doors there, and it's it's not great along the doors because it's piano black just, marks and scratches so easily. So every time you touch it, it leaves a mark. It's very easy to scratch. So if you think about it on the door where you're constantly grabbing, constantly looking for switches, you're resting your arm and you watch on it, it is going to be quite sort of scratched up pretty quickly. So I think that's just a poor material choice there along the center and the sides as well. I'll also point out though, I quite like the use of this sort of fabric material on the dashboard, just gives it a bit of a sort of modern vibe. Um, you've got uh, touch points over here. So uh, soft there, soft on the door as well. Uh, how soft are they? We've got our durometer. We've tested the main surfaces in this cabin. If you do want to see how this car compares to others that we've tested before, have a look at the link in the description below. Now, what about build quality? Let's see what that's like. That's sort of a bit wonky there in the center. The rest sort of feels okay. Uh, and this is what the door slam sounds like. Now let's talk infotainment and we'll start off with the main infotainment screen. So it's a 12.3 inch display. I'll then talk about the uh, seven inch display we have ahead of the driver there in just a second. Um, so uh, pretty high resolution screen. It's a very similar infotainment system to what we've seen in Lexus products, which is cool to see. Uh, so you've got uh, inbuilt satellite navigation, nice and quick and uh, yeah, very sharp screen as well. Uh, you've got AM, FM, DAB, digital radio, and that's all uh, push through a six speaker sound system. Sound system's okay, uh, nothing sort of too crazy. Uh, you also have a bunch of different sort of bits and pieces here that are specific to this as an electric vehicle. So basically you can uh, you can set charge limits and, and um, vehicle alerts, charging schedules, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then in addition to that, you also have the ability to do software updates. There's a browser here as well. Uh, but it needs a, a Wi-Fi connection running for that to work. Uh, in terms of smartphone mirroring, you have both Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. Apple CarPlay is wireless, nice and quick, takes up that whole screen, very nice and sharp as well, which is good news. And this is what Android Auto looks like. Uh, so this is wireless as well. So again, nice and sharp and quick, very impressive. Now, what's not as impressive is this screen here ahead of the driver. So seven inch display, the contents of it is good. You've got speed, battery, uh, odometer, all your sort of critical functions. Problem is, I cannot see any of it. I literally cannot see one thing on that screen. The only thing I can see is the time in the top right corner and the temperature in the top left. Everything else is invisible to me because of the top of this steering wheel. It is such a bizarre mess from Toyota. So the only way I can see it is by dropping the steering wheel all the way down like that. Problem with that is I can't actually drive the car properly then because if I am driving, I can't turn the steering wheel. My hands just hit my knee and I, I can't turn the actual steering wheel. So uh, yeah, and then when I push it back up, I can turn the steering wheel, but I can't see anything there. So it needs to be able to go further up but uh, it, it just doesn't do that. So uh, when they engineer cars, they, they look at uh, trying to fit items like fit within certain percentiles. And clearly my body for some reason is outside of the range of Toyota's uh, engineering percentiles because uh, yeah, I just find it really odd that someone that is what I think of normal stature uh, can't see the speedo. The only sort of weird thing I have is probably long legs and a shorter torso, but um, yeah, it's just a, a really, really odd one. So um, see what that's like when we go for a drive, but um, that is that. Now, what about your safety tech? So you've got autonomous emergency braking with pedestrian and cyclist detection. You've got an auto dimming rear vision mirror. This car has Toyota connected services, so you can connect to it remotely using an app and then use an SOS button if you need to there. Bizarrely, there's no blind spot monitoring. You've got an option, uh, the all wheel drive version to get blind spot monitoring 
which I just think is is another strange miss as well. You also have a uh, lane departure warning, a lane keeping assistant and adaptive cruise control. So we'll test some of that technology a little bit later on. On the parking front, you have front and rear parking sensors and a reverse view camera. I'll show you what that looks like. I'll pop this into reverse. There it is there. So quality of that's actually pretty decent. I can see what's written there on our suitcase pretty clearly. So that is all uh, very straightforward. That's what the horn sounds like. Now, practicality, let's start off with your connectivity. In here, you've got a USB-A port. This is also where you'll find a wireless phone charger on the all-wheel drive model. The base model doesn't have any wireless phone charging. You do have two USB-C ports down here and a 12-volt outlet as well. In terms of storing cups and stuff, you've got two cup holders down here. Sort of, it's quite a way in, so, you know, if you do put your coffee and stuff in, it can be a little bit tedious to, to yank that out. Um, but... You know, it is what it is. Uh, in the door, you also have uh, bottle holders. So we'll see if it fits our big bottle. Nice, that fits nicely inside the door. In terms of other storage, you've got a little card slot down here for credit cards and, and that type of thing. Center console, so this slides forward to close that section up and to give you a bit more comfort. It also opens up to expose an enormous center console, which is great, uh, and this removable section. The reason it's so big is because, strangely, it doesn't have a glove box, so there's there's nothing in here, which is a bit odd. Uh, down here, you've got some more uh, storage as well, and then a little sort of phone holder type thing down the front there too. And that's about it on the storage front. So it is sort of fairly well laid out with plenty of little spots to put your things, but yeah, that, that is a strange one about the glove box. Moving on to your comfort. So you have dual zone automatic climate control, You've got heated seats here for the front row, um, and that all sort of works fairly well. You have an eco mode for the air conditioning system too, plus the ability to close off uh, your vents in the second row as well. So if you only have the front row occupied, it means you're going to save a little bit of energy by not having to cool or heat the second row. Um, steering, so yeah, it offers both tilts and uh, reach adjustment. Our seats are electrically adjustable for the driver, so you can go forwards and backwards. Your backrest can go forwards and backwards. Front of the seat can go up, back of the seat can go up, and then you have lumbar adjustment as well. Seats are nice and comfy as well. You have like a, a cloth and a sort of faux leather material there too, so they hug you in nicely and give you a bit of uh, comfort on long, longer distance drives. Then on our reach test, uh, all of this stuff is easy to reach while you're driving, but these outer edges on the screen need a bit of a lean in if you do need to press any buttons out there. Okay, so second row of the BZ4X. Uh, knee room is fantastic. Toe room, not amazing. It's sort of a little bit cramped there. Uh, head room is pretty good. Yeah, the floor sits pretty high up, so you sort of have that effect that you have in the Model 3 where you sort of have your knees really high up, um, but you can sort of get a little bit comfortable if you sit like this. More piano black here. Um, you've got two USB-C charging ports. You've got map pockets, air vents down here as well else down there. You've got a center armrest here with two cup holders and a little sort of phone holder section there. Um, outside of that it's all sort of pretty straightforward back here. Uh, if you've got kids, two ISO fix points on the outboard seats and three top tether points as well. Uh, oh, our window test. Does it go all the way down? So it's auto up and down which is nice. Oh, look at that, it goes all the way down. So what does your cargo space look like? Crack this open. So you have just over 450 litres of cargo space available. It's not a massive space, and part of the reason they lose out on that space is the cargo floor, beneath the cargo floor. This is adjustable, so if you don't have stuff stored there, you can lower that cargo floor. But there's no sort of big cavity down here like you're going to find in something like a Model Y. And as a result of that, you only really have storage above floor outside of just a, a cable for, for under there. So I think that could probably be just a little bit better given that this is a front wheel drive and be a full electric platform as well. I'll show you what it looks like with our bags in there. So it's the laptop bag. And that's the suitcase that kind of gives you a bit of a picture of what it's like. Now we don't actually have a figure for the amount of space you have in here when you drop the second row. Unfortunately, Toyota doesn't provide it, but I'll show you what it looks like when the second row is dropped, which you have to do by leaning in and then pushing the seats down. Here it is there. So it's not a bad space, almost a flat floor, just a slight incline once you hit that second row. Now let's talk charging. Let me run you through how this works. So you've got a manual charge port there. You have both AC and DC charging. On the AC front, it'll do three phase up to 11 kilowatts. On the DC front, 
it'll do a peak of about 150 kilowatts and an average of 100 kilowatts. So that's actually not too bad for an entry level uh, sort of larger electric vehicle like this, uh, but it doesn't match anything like uh, the EV6 or the Ionic 5, which run on 800 volt architecture and can maintain a much higher charge level. Uh, battery size, 64 kilowatt hours is the usable battery size, and it is a lithium ion battery. Uh, it is the type that you will only charge to around 80 or 90% regularly. It's not the type that you can freely run up to 100% like the uh, LFP batteries you'll find in a Tesla or other equivalent entry level vehicles that are manufactured manufactured in China. And then your driving range is just under 440 kilometers on the WLTP cycle. Okay, so we've just hit the road in the BZ4X. Uh, it, is, it is hot today. It's only just under 30 degrees, but it just feels really hot. So it's quite a bitey sun. Uh, so you're gonna hear the air conditioning running a little bit in the background there. Um, so I'm gonna start off with elephant in the room. Uh, I mentioned this earlier, but I cannot see the speedometer gauge at all. So. I don't know how fast we're going. All I can see is the clock and the temperature. So you're going to see me just peering over every now and then. Um, yeah. So anyway, uh, now front wheel drive here in the entry level, which is interesting because a lot of manufacturers have gone down the path of uh, rear wheel drive for their entry level vehicles. Uh, it's much of a muchness, but it kind of suits the rest of the Toyota range, which is predominantly front wheel drive or all wheel drive. You do have a couple of those exceptions that are rear wheel drive, but um, I think that's their sort of expertise. And if they do want to carry over the feel of this vehicle behind the wheel compared to something like a Camry, then it is pretty straightforward. You hop in, same driving characteristics and away you go. Now in saying that, what does it all feel like behind the wheel? Let's give it a little stab here. So one of the limitations you have with a front wheel drive vehicle is that you're limited in terms of the amount of power and torque you can send through the front axle because it, it, uh, it tends to unload easier through corners and it leads to wheel spin and it just leads to that sort of negative driving experience. So here they're, they've got 150 kilowatts of power running through it, 266 newton meters of torque, and that's about as far as you can go before you start having issues with traction loss in an electric vehicle where you have that instant throttle response. You can remedy that with wider tires and, and a stiffer body, but that then walks back all of the Toyota-ness of this, right? So that is, uh, you know, as much efficiency as you can get out of the tires, a softer ride, that kind of thing. Now, the official energy economy figure is just under 17 kilowatt hours per 100 Ks. Uh, we recorded a figure just earlier of around 17, so it's pretty much bang on the money there. How does it compare to the competitors? Well, uh, Tesla Model Y, for example, will average 13, 14 uh, kilowatt hours per 100 Ks out of a Model Y, so it probably still has a little bit of a way to go in terms of economy. Hey everyone, sorry to randomly interrupt the video. Um, we have sort of heat wave conditions at the moment. It is really hot outside, and uh, this is after we filmed our original review. I've got to call out the air conditioner. It is absolutely incredible. Uh, this is the best air conditioner that I've tested in an electric car today, and I don't know, it just seems most electric cars will taper back air conditioning to save energy, whereas with this, if you don't have the AC and Eco mode, it is pumping out ice cold air, just like uh, other Toyota products I've experienced before that are internal combustion. So yeah, Massive bonus on a hot day to have a nice cool cabin. And there's no glass roof here as well, which definitely adds to that. I can basically hold my hand there. This car's been out in the sun for a couple of hours now. Uh, it's over 40 degrees outside, no dramas at all. So uh, yeah, pretty impressed with the air conditioning system in the BZ4X. Now, there is no one pedal driving, which is pretty frustrating. Uh, I do love that feature in a lot of electric vehicles and there's just nothing like that here. You do have this button, which it's a little foot symbol up the top there and it kind of increases regen but won't bring the car to a stop and it doesn't sort of yeah i don't know it doesn't really sort of have any meaning to it outside of just adding a little bit more region i would love to see a single pedal driving mode here the car can do software updates so hopefully that is something they can bring in over time now what's your ride like in and around the city Look, I, th I think this is probably where this is one of the vehicle's strong suits. Uh, the ride is, is great. It's not too firm, it's not too soft. It's sort of just where it needs to be in the middle there. If you look at some of the other competitors in this segment, Tesla Model Y, the ride is really not very good at all. So that is one of that vehicle's uh, biggest downsides. Here though, they've been able to engineer a ride that just feels nice. The steering feel is uh, fairly good as well. So a little bit heavy, but um, you know, you've got enough feel off center there to give you an idea of what the vehicle's doing. I'd be keen to have a drive of this in all-wheel drive trim just to see what that's like because 
I think with the all-wheel drive, you're getting just a little bit more poke, a little bit more traction as well, and I think it's going to be the more dynamic experience. Now, it's time for our sine wave. Let's see what this is like at 130 k's an hour. That is the maximum speed limit here in Australia. And if you are going to be doing any touring or driving remotely, it is uh, going to be important to know what it's like. So there's 130. Yeah, look, it's pretty floaty. Um, I don't know, I, I would just describe it in one word as a Toyota. It, um, it just feels like a Toyota. They've just dialed in a lot of softness there and just a lot of comfort as opposed to sportiness. Okay, it is bumpy road time. Let's see how good the ride actually is. Dial up 90 k's an hour, there it is. All right, so this is one of the worst roads in Australia. Well, simulation of it. Give us an idea of what the ride is like here. We've got a condensed sine wave here as well. That's actually quite good. It's falling into those divots nicely. So, yeah, look, like I said, the ride is um, just really nice and comfortable. We've done a good job with it. In terms of your drive modes, you don't actually have like a sport mode. You've got an eco mode. So that basically uh, just dulls throttle response and also uh, can taper back the air conditioning as well. You've got a snow mode also, uh, but there is no sport mode. But I thought, let's go for a spin around the track and see uh, what it's like once you get stuck into it, see if it is remotely sporty. <laughs> let's see what it feels like. All right, Frank Fiddle feels good. A little bit of understeer there. There's that uh, traction control light flashing in that top corner. Um, doing pretty much what the Tesla Model Y does where it just unloads the wheel and will just constantly be flashing that traction control light. Uh, unlike the Tesla Model Y, you can actually switch off uh, traction and stability control. So I'm just going to see whether that improves things here at all. Uh, this isn't something that you would normally do if you own the car, but I'm just curious to see. We test all of these cars back to back in the same way whether you do get improved dynamics when some of those uh, nanny systems are switched off because I think it's a new platform. They should have been able to extract some handling out of this. See, now that is much better. I can stay firmly planted on the throttle through the corner and it's able to allow there to be a little bit of wheel slip as we exit the corner. Without it sort of uh, killing everything with traction control. So it's actually surprising <laughs> once it is all switched off. This thing actually hammers for a front wheel drive car. It is moving. Nice. There you go. Our GoPro's about to fall over there. But um, yeah, that is hauling along really nicely. Genuinely surprised by that. Uh, I was not expecting this to be as good as it is once you switch all that stuff off. It kind of just comes into a life of its own. The traction controls here just really kill all of your fun. Um, and that is a point there with sport mode. If you can engineer a sport mode, it means that you can have a little bit more slip in the traction control and it gives you that enjoyment behind the wheel. So I don't know why they haven't done, done that here. Hopefully that's something they can put in as well because I think it would really improve the driving characteristics if you did want to go out for a bit of a fun drive every now and then. So what about your visibility? So. We've already discussed the speedo that I can't see, but the wing mirrors are nice and big. It is really disappointing there are no blind spot monitors uh, that come standard here. You have to option the all-wheel drive to get those, but visibility out the back is great, and the wing mirrors are nice and big as well, so you can clearly see down the side of the vehicle there, which is good. Uh, and in terms of parking, that reverse view camera is great. Uh, I mean, that's pretty much all you need with front and rear parking sensors as well. Let's talk about road noise. So. A bit surprised that there is as much road noise as there is inside the cabin, especially on coarse chip uh, country roads. It tends to be a little bit boomy inside the cabin. You are picking up a lot of the, the road noise that comes through the tyres. We put it up against our calibrated sound measure and this is how it went. If you do want to see how this car compares to other vehicles that we've tested before, there's a link in the description below. Now, not that you're going to be doing any towing, but towing capacity comes in at 750 kilos with a brake trailer, so it's not exactly a huge amount of uh, towing, and you probably don't want to be towing with an EV anyway. Uh, they're just not designed for that, and you'll end up with uh, barely any battery range at all. Probably worth pointing out at this uh, time as well that in terms of curb mass, we're talking about under two tonnes, so a little under two tonnes. It is a lot, 
but when you think about it in the context of an electric vehicle, it's actually not a huge amount. The thing I find interesting, we actually recently reviewed the RAV4 Prime over in the States, and that weighs around the same as this, and that uses an internal combustion engine plus a 20-odd kilowatt hour battery to give it um, 100 k's worth of driving range. So it is interesting to see uh, what kind of crossover you get there when you look at other vehicles in the Toyota family. Okie dokie, so time to do a little bit of testing of the semi-autonomous systems here. Now I'm going to have to do a lot of lurching here. Uh, okay, so we'll set cruise control first. So that's adaptive cruise mode. And we will set that. Try and set that. Uh, there we go, set that to 70 k's an hour, which is what we typically do. Steering wheel there is green as well, so that is now keeping us in our lane. We're going to test the three outer lanes here to see how this performs. Typically, the further it is out, the sort of more work it has to do to hold it within its lane. And it sort of gives you an idea of what it's like out on the main road. So, good for lane one. Uh, okay, it's gone green there for lane two. That's doing a good job. It's holding us nice and central in the lane. Alrighty, jump up to the top lane. This will be the ultimate test. Wait for that to go green. All right, it's green. I'm going to gradually let go of the wheel. Oh, look at that. That's doing a great job. So that's holding us uh, just off the line there, heading toward the centre. So that's a pass in all three lanes. It is a pretty impressive effort. Okay, time to do a bit of performance testing. Um, I wanted to tell you about our website, carexpert.com.au. Uh, we actually do a stack of uh, comparisons. We offer lots of vehicle data and just more deeper insights into uh, some of the cars that we test. So um, make sure you check that out. You can just Google Help Me Car Expert. It'll take you to our site and explain how it all works. Now, as far as I can tell, there's no official 0 to 100 time. Uh, there's no sport mode here either. So we'll just turn traction control off. We'll just jab the throttle. In fact, I'll put it in hold mode, and then I'll just jab the throttle, and we'll go all the way through to 120. Uh, battery capacity is at 48%, so not ideal. Neither is the temperature at 28 degrees, but it is what it is. Here we go. It's actually 266 newton meters. Doesn't sound like much, but it uh, gets along all right there. Uh, okay, we're almost there. All right, there's 120. All right, we'll come to a stop. Let's have a look at how that went. So, 0 to 100 k's an hour, 8.25 seconds. So, uh, okay, but not amazing. And then 80 to 120, 6.36 seconds as well. Um, yeah, keep in mind that if you do have passengers in the car, it's going to feel significantly slower than that. So it probably is worth, despite the fact you lose range due to the added weight, but it probably is worth checking out the all-wheel drive model if you do want just that little bit of extra poke. Okay, time to stop from 100. Let's see how good the brake and tyre package is. Okay, there we are, over 100 k's an hour, and... Oh. God, it's got the same noisy traction control ABS system that Prado has. Um, okay, so 100 to 0. Uh, 2.81 seconds, 39.24 metres. So it's actually a pretty decent stopping distance for a vehicle this size. So um, yeah, not too bad. And now, how quick does it go in reverse? Now we'll turn off traction control because that helps Hilux go faster. Let's see if it makes any difference here as well. Not really, but look at it, 32 kilometres an hour. Okay, so the Toyota BZ4X, what do we think? Look, to me, I don't know how that steering wheel thing got past engineering. I think I'm a fairly sort of normal looking bloke. I do have a lot of chicken in here, but that's okay. Uh, but in terms of my height and stuff, I think I'm fairly normal. So if, if I can't see the speed up, it must mean that there are other people that don't see it as well. So it is just a bit of a weird one. Hopefully that is something they can address. I'd also love to see just a, a limited traction mode, like a sport mode to make this you know, fun to drive as well, because uh, EV drivers need to have fun as well. Um, how does it go though, compared to its competitors? Look, I don't think it's as sophisticated as something like a Tesla Model Y. Even the Ionic 5, EV6, they all have 800 
100 volt charging and a lot of incentives to really go and, and, and look at those vehicles as an alternative. But to me, the type of person that's gonna be buying this is someone that's, that is just used to Toyotas and they just want simple. And this is literally the definition of that. You can hop inside it, it just goes and drives like any other Toyota does. You don't need a science degree to, to run stuff. You don't need to know things. It just works. And I think that uh, there is going to be that level of appeal to a lot of people. It is also covered by Toyota's guaranteed future value. Uh, you've got a lot of other benefits associated with owning a Toyota that then apply to this as well. Along with a big warranty as well, 10 year warranty on the battery. So they have really focused on making sure that that battery has longevity. So let me know what you reckon in the comments section below. Have you test driven one of these? What did you think? I'm keen to try the all wheel drive version because I think that will probably add an extra element of uh, dynamicism dynamism, whatever the word is to the whole package. It'll make it a bit more enjoyable to drive. But let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure you like it and you share it with your mates. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon. But until next time, take it easy.